Like Chuck Berry, Johnny Cash was another songwriter and performer whose distinctive music crossed many genre boundaries. Yet unlike Berry, Orbison or Presley, who primarily found fame as rock and roll performers, Cash was never classified within this blooming new musical form and instead represented a more idiosyncratic fringe of country music. And this towering and inimitable figure, another success from Sam Phillips' Sun Records, would also make a strong impression on Springsteen. Johnny Cash came from a rural background, son of a sharecropper. Didn't really get into music in, in a big way, I don't think, until the mid-50s when he was stationed in Germany in the Air Force and he started playing guitar and songwriting. Again, significantly, he was a songwriter too, which, uh, you know, there's quite a run of these people do turn out to be songwriters. When he came back, he got signed to Sun Records and was, you know, it was part of that early rockabilly movement in the sense that he was part of Sun, but of course he was, he was a country performer, really. He wasn't any, much to do with rock and roll at all, really. His songs and his themes really weren't, weren't part of the rock and roll lexicon either. I Walk the Line is a, it's a song of rugged individualism, but it doesn't strike me in any way as being connected with the teenage experience. It's, uh, it's, it's a very adult song. And that's the key to Johnny Cash in a way. He always wrote adult themes. No coincidence that he forged a career in country music. As sure as night is dark and day is light. Unlike almost everybody else in, in, in say, Nashville or on, on the country scene, um, there was nothing affected about Johnny Cash. It didn't, it seemed to come across that he was a country star and yet he wasn't. He was a man who never lost his roots and he never lost the, 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 the common touch. He always retained the links with the blue collar audience. And that's something that he shared with Bruce Springsteen. The crucial link between the two is that link with the common man. Bruce Springsteen has predicated his entire career upon that. And I, th I think that's, 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 that honesty and earnestness is, is something that you see in Johnny Cash. I wear the black for the poor and the beaten down. Living in the hopeless, hungry side of town. Cash was very important as an icon, and, and I think that if you think of him again as one of the, sort of these prophets, he's sort of the seeker. He's the guy that sort of roams the landscape. You know, someone like Roy Orbison has a kind of interior landscape that he sort of mines. Um, uh, Johnny Cash, of course, has lots of demons to deal with, and that sort of... Um, Psychic intensity coupled with this sort of deceptive simplicity is really one of the great strengths of his work And of course, that's one of the great strengths of Springsteen's work cash as a sort of detached observer You know uh, as a sort of stoic figure is something that figures in Springsteen's work I think Johnny Cash is important for Bruce mostly as a symbol, you know I think that the kind of independence of spirit that Johnny Cash represented um, is something that Bruce uh, has aspired to I think that for Bruce, you know, that's what he got from Johnny Cash. Integrity about the music and just integrity about himself as a person. You were going to stand alone. You, know, you, you, had, you were willing to do that. You were capable of doing that. You, know, you could be part of a community, but if you needed to be by yourself, you were capable of doing that. I think, I think uh, Bruce learned that from Johnny Cash. Yet although Cash's attitude and singularity may have influenced Springsteen, a sonic connection became apparent as the New Jersey singer-songwriter matured and tackled new musical styles. I think Cash's influence on Springsteen is Nebraska, really. I, I don't see it much beyond Nebraska, but I do see it quite profoundly in Nebraska. And it's there in, in his guitar playing. It's, it's, a, it's a lot simpler. But also in his, his vocal styling, it's bleaker in, in, in tone. But I think most importantly of all, it's the themes. What Nebraska achieves is that it goes back to the world of Johnny Cash. The characters in the songs, uh, the themes and the motifs are, are almost straight out of the Johnny Cash lexicon in a sense. Nebraska is an album which is inhabited by serial killers, the homeless, the abandoned, the fatherless, the dispossessed. I mean, any one of those songs you could transpose into the Falls in Prison or San Quentin album, and they certainly wouldn't sound out of place, especially, you know, the the title track and indeed Johnny 99, um, these are death row songs. So these are songs that are either death row or somebody that's, you know, that's, that's in prison for 99 years and actually would prefer to be executed in Johnny 99 sense. Down in the part of town where when you hit a red light you don't stop and stare at young Johnny down. Of course, greatly significant that Johnny Cash covered Johnny 99 himself. 
any one of those songs Johnny Cash could have recorded even more, you know, 20 years before and they, they wouldn't have sounded out of place. And it's certainly not pastiche what Springsteen is doing. I mean, um, they do sound modern at the same time, even though in a way that, that Born to Run did. You didn't listen to Born to Run and feel it was just an exercise in nostalgia, which in one sense it was. But, you know, it was also about, you know, the, it, he somehow had the ability to make it sound modern as well. And that's what I think um, he achieves in Nebraska. It's an old form, but it's, it's, it's uh, again, Springsteen's got this great trick of taking old forms and renewing them and making them sound terribly modern. And you're on right to believe I'd be better off dead If you can take a man's life for the thoughts that are in his head I think that there was a kind of mutual recognition there you know, that this is an emotional space that not many characters could inhabit. But, you know, Johnny Cash was able to inhabit it, and then Bruce was able to inhabit it, and in a sense, they were able to share each other's music. Nebraska sounds as though Johnny Cash is almost intoning some of the, 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 the words uh, with that kind of laconic delivery. There's just a meanness in the world. You can just imagine Johnny Cash saying that, the same as I shot a man in Reno one just to let him die. It's the, sa the same kind of delivery that y you need to get absolutely correct or it sounds fatuous. It has to be the character comes with it. And what's really interesting about this, I think, is that I think Springsteen was really pleased. In fact, I think he was delighted. We know he was listening to the Sun recordings at the time. We know that Johnny Cash has covered it. We, all, of, all of the time that Springsteen was doing it, he didn't know that. Later on in life, when he was asked to give a tribute to Johnny Cash, he sang Give My Love to Rose, which is an early recording, one of the ones he said he was listening to, we can now presume. And what is really interesting about this is that Springsteen performs it in Nebraska mode. So it's as though he's saying, thank you, Johnny Cash, for inspiring me to sing like you in Nebraska, and here's one of yours done back. And I found him by the railroad tracks this morning I could see that he was nearly dead I knelt down beside him and I listened his performance of it is different from everything else he was doing at the time, and he goes back to that laconic, stoic uh, way of, of performing it. And if, if you think about it, I mean, the, the, the guy in the song's dying, you know, and he's offering this man his bank account to take a message to his wife. He's going to die not knowing if any of this happens. And he says it all in a kind of, well, that's the kind of thing life throws at you, and you just have to get on with it. And I also think it's important he's dressed in black. He is the man in black as he's saying it. So it's Springsteen playing Cash playing Springsteen. And it's just lovely, and it's a great song to do it with. Although Springsteen was influenced by the complex and mature persona of Johnny Cash, he was equally drawn to an artist who in many ways represented the antithesis of this. I'm gonna tell you how it's gonna be Are you gonna give your love to me? In a professional career that spanned only three years, Buddy Holly made a phenomenal impact on the world of rock and roll. A singer-songwriter whose buoyant, dynamic and refreshing compositions remain landmarks in the history of popular music. Having turned to rock and roll after witnessing an Elvis show in 1955, Holly and his band, The Crickets, released a string of seminal singles and albums during their brief career. At the forefront of these records were Holly's unique vocal approach, influential lead and rhythm guitar style, and his genius for simple song construction. All talents lost to the world of music when he died tragically in a plane crash in 1959. Like Roy Orbison, Buddy Holly emerged from Texas, and his case from Lubbock, Texas. Actually, you can think of sort of several comparisons between Orbison and Holly, which are quite, you know, interesting and unusual. I mean, not sim simply, they both wore glasses, right? But I mean, more importantly, I mean, he was a songwriter as well as Orbison, and they were both songwriters. They're both from Texas. They both recorded for Norman Petty at his New Mexico studio in Clovis, and they both were, you know, rockabilly exponents originally. I think the big difference is, is whereas uh, Roy Orbison's career didn't really start until 1960 in terms of being a, a hit maker, um, Holly lived and died in the 50s and, and had a phenomenal run of, of hits you know, during his short, very painfully short lifetime. Unlike many other songwriters of the period, Buddy Holly wasn't writing novelty songs and 
I think it was some, something about the particular nature of his songwriting which is very appealing. He wasn't writing songs that were particularly macho in any way. He, you know, he, Holly was very polite, but he also didn't put down w women in his songs. There was, there was nothing misogynistic in the songs of, of Buddy Holly. More importantly than that, perhaps, I think, is there's a tremendous sense of wonder in Buddy Holly's songs at the time, that almost adolescent notion of the importance of the first date or the first kiss, where it becomes more important than life itself. Holly's work captures that very, very well. Even in the title, something like, oh boy, the exclamation. And what he's talking about is love, but it's love discovered, and it's love discovered in a way that is fresh and new. And there's a, there's a, there's a freshness and, and an honesty about it all that, that is very, very endearing. It's astounding to think that Buddy Holly died when he was 22. You know, I mean, he really had a massive impact and influence. I mean, on the Beatles, uh, I mean, among many, many other artists. Uh, yeah, there was a beautiful kind of open-heartedness about his songwriting, you know. Uh, a, a tremendous simplicity. You know, these words, you know, the, you know almost always like one and two syllable words, you know, in his songs. Uh, you can't just boil feeling down any more uh, simply than he was able to get it. At the same time, as there was a sense of Buddy Holly as a, you know, as a kind of singer-songwriter. You know, he was the guy, you know, he wrote his own songs, he performed himself, you know, he had his own look. All of those elements that would come to be really significant in rock and roll was something that, you know, got associated with Buddy Holly. You know, who really wanted to sort of control the terms of his art in every sense. You know, uh, write the songs, arrange the songs, record with a band that had integrity as a band, not just a collection of people behind you, make records as opposed to, you know, put out hits. But I think that that notion of wanting to control the terms of your art and to think in terms of a career is so elemental to, to Bruce Springsteen's whole notion of himself. And I think the, pers the first person who sort of um, illuminated that as a, as a serious possibility was Holly. When Bruce talks about Buddy Holly keeping him honest, you know, there's not a lot of trickery in those songs. You know, I mean, Bruce can really, you know, Bruce can be a ham and Bruce can go over the top. And I think... You know, what Buddy Holly says is, you know, you don't really need to do very much of anything if you've got the goods, you know. If the song is good and you can sing it, you don't even need a lot of words. You know, you don't need big, big hooks. You know, it just, just let the song, let, let, let the quality of what you do do the work. When Springsteen refers to Buddy Holly in terms of trying to keep himself honest, I mean, what does he actually mean by that? He wants things to be fresh. But he also doesn't want to ever be cynical. I mean, the, 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 uh, another characteristic of, of, of Bruce Springsteen's work is that it's always, he, he, he strives towards idealism. It strives towards trying to make the world better. Um, and, you know, it goes right back to Holly, who never had a chance to, to be jaded or cynical. He died before that time. But within the, the, the work that, that he did in that short period, it creates the, the, the wonders of adolescence. You know, if you're trying to rediscover innocence, you know, the, one of the ways you do it is to go back and listen to those Buddy Holly records and think, yeah, that's the essence of it. Springsteen was not only attracted to the A-list of popular music performers, however. Where Presley, Orbison, Berry, Cash and Holly were major figures whose influence was felt across the entire spectrum of rock and roll, there were more marginal American artists who shared a vitality and purity with the more high-profile stars and who also inspired Springsteen's work. Perhaps the most significant of these performers was Gary U.S. Bonds. A young singer based in Norfolk, Virginia, Bonds had first emerged as a member of the group The Turks in the late 1950s before signing as a solo artist to the small label Le Grand Records. Despite initially recording two albums of material, it was as a singles artist that Bonds rose to prominence. And in the early 60s, when the first wave of rock and roll had lost some of its power, he soon became successful with his own brand of back-to-basics good-time music. I guess they considered me kind of a rebel because I was doing, you know, yelling and screaming. You know, instead of trying to be smooth, I was the old uh, Norfolk country boy, you know, <laughs> riding the wild horse, you know, and uh, that was cool. And we, we, we didn't really try to uh, 
be any, anybody but ourselves because we were down in Norfolk, Virginia. We weren't influenced by, you know, New York or California or Chicago or Detroit, and you know. We were just doing what we thought was good. But I was doing fun music, you know. I was just happy, you know, let's have a good time, let, let's boogie music, you know, and uh, I think we got that. After the release of his first top ten single, New Orleans, Bonds recorded his definitive rock and roll party record, the number one hit, Quarter to Three. It was originally recorded by uh, Daddy G in the Church Street Five, the band, and uh, as an instrumental. They put it out, but it wasn't doing anything, you know? So one day we were at the studio, uh, me and Daddy G and Frank Guido and everybody in the band, and, and they said, well, you know, this is such a great, you know, fun song, you know? You, you think you could write lyrics to it? And I went, yeah, I can do anything, you know, give me another drink. <laughs> anyway, I went in the, in the office and we wrote some lyrics down for about 10 minutes and came back. And then we're cool, but let's record it, because we were at the studio anyway, you know, what we referred to as a studio. And uh, we just went in and just did it, you know. And um, a few weeks later, there it was, you know, making its way up the charts. I remember hearing Gary U.S. Bonds when I was a kid. I mean, these these songs that just sounded like they were recorded in an airplane hangar somewhere. You know, there's this clang and crash, and I mean, they just had just such a great sound. And he had such a great voice, you know, and um, they were just great rock and roll party records. Yeah. 